Welcome everyone to the HCIL's uh, 30th anniversary seminar series. The key feature being this is our 30th year. Uh, all kinds of fun things, including having 30 cakes once a week, more or less, and, <laughs> uh, and a bunch of uh, seminars for which we are very happy to have Mark Kuzail visiting from Georgia Tech. If you don't know Mark, he is a uh, really the preeminent person in the country thinking about computer science education. Uh, he has been really innovative at Georgia Tech, and in fact, more broadly in the state of Georgia, thinking about how to educate the state's computer scientists, um, uh, broadening his interest outside of the university to include uh, children uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, he has thought also about how to broaden participation within the university, getting people interested outside of the traditional geeky types. Uh, and I suspect maybe we'll hear a little bit about little bit. computational media. A little bit, yep. Uh, so you'll hear something about that. Uh, and uh, uh, aside from my positive opinion, he has lots of other people thinking of positive opinions. Of <laughs> uh, at least three awards in the last few years on both uh, teaching and service awards from IEEE, ACM, and Georgia Tech. So. Uh, I'm honored to have you here. Well, thank you, Ben. And uh, with that, you uh, share with us Thanks. your thoughts. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. So um, my, my, my talk today is only a little bit about CS education. Uh, years and years ago, and, and, and Tammy knows a little bit when I, I used to do this sort of work, I used to do a lot of work in computer-supported collaborative learning. And nowadays, MOOCs are the thing, right? And everybody's all interested in online learning. And so uh, Ben Schneiderman asked me if I would emphasize more of those issues, online education, and what do we know about what works and what doesn't work. So here's my general story today. Um, my argument is that the key to effective online education is understanding why. And there are four seats here and another up here if people want to come on up. Don't have to stand in the back. Appreciate it. Um, in particular, I want to talk a good bit to you about context um, and about ideas like situated learning. And then I'm going to tell you four brief stories. The first one I'm going to tell you is about how anchored collaboration facilitates learning. I'll explain what I mean by anchored collaboration. The second is about collaboration leading to lower cost learning, but only sometimes, because in the end, culture trumps collaboration. Third, for adults, sometimes you have to embed the education. Basically, you have to hide it. I'll explain what I mean by that. And then how explaining how and why improves learning from videos. So let me explain a little bit where I'm coming from in terms of learning. Um, my perspective on learning is that it's a conscious process of sense making. That's how people learn talks a lot about that. But in particular, I'm influenced by the situated learning perspective of Leib and Wenger, which is, I think, mid 80s, wasn't it? Yeah. 90, 90s, yeah. So. Uh, it's, it's been a while now, but in particular what they argue is that students are learning in order to become part of a community of practice. That especially a graduate student life is, is exactly that, right? You say, I want to be like that one day, so I'm going to go study with the people who are that until I can become that. And that's what motivates people. Motivate, students undertake activities that make sense to them as part of the community. And something that we definitely get in computer science education, uh, I know Evan probably sees this and other people who have taught intro classes, students are really interested in authenticity. The number one thing that I get from students, particularly if we use an unusual tool like Dr. Java or an unusual language like Squeak or Scheme is, this isn't what they really use, is it? It's not a real thing. Authenticity really matters a lot in a lot of these. And, and students feel, well, why, why can't you give me the real thing? Um, and that's, that, that's particularly an issue with uh, underrepresented groups. Okay, so um, I'm going to start out talking about anchored collaboration. Back in, I think it was the 1980s, the Cognition and Technology Group at Vanderbilt was doing something they called anchored instruction, where students would learn, uh, would solve a math problem that was anchored in something real, like a, um, uh, an experience that was captured on a video. So we watched. Jasper get into his boat, we see how much gas he puts into his boat, he goes down the river, we watch milestones go by, we see him fill up his tank at some spot and then continue down the river and then everything stops and you say, can he get back home without refilling the tank? And now it's a, it's, a, it's a contextualized math problem. The students go back and forth over the video to try to understand it. The real idea here is that the instruction is anchored in something real that the students, that the students really appreciate. So Jennifer Turns and I worked on a tool called Web Camille, where Web Camille was just an online threaded discussion group. No big deal, except that every discussion can have its own unique URL. So now we could say, here's something that you want to talk about, and click, actually we'll do this. 
here's a, uh, a bunch of problems that might be on the midterm exam. And click here, and now you're on the discussion about that problem. Okay, so it's anchored collaboration. It's not just go off to Piazza and go solve a problem or go to the discussion forum, completely apart from the videos and the homework. This is the collaboration is anchored to the thing that you want to talk about. And what we found was that when we did anchored collaboration and compared to Usenet news groups, students tended to talk longer and on topic because they knew why they were there. They were, we answered the question why. You're in this discussion. And so this got us to wondering, okay, the anchored collaboration is a nice result. If you anchor it, you get these longer on-topic discussions. But we wondered, was the, was the critical feature of the anchor that the teacher created it? What if you let students create the discussion spaces? Would students participate in the same sort of uh, in, the, in the same way? And that's when we created the Swiki or CoWeb. Swiki was Squeak Wiki, um, based on the tool that we're using. Most people around Georgia Tech called it the CoWeb, the collaborative website. It's basically a wiki. We were doing wikis before Wikipedia. Um, you can see actually my picture, my pictures here in Netscape. Um, so, and, and IE even. Um, so what people, uh, it's just a simple wiki, the same sorts of things you've seen. Otherwise, uh, one critical feature that's different is to create a link, you put asterisks on either side of your title. And that creates a, a, a page with that title. So we use the CoWeb in a lot of different contexts in, um, in computer science classes. Uh, we used it as an organizational memory. Students on a project team would use a wiki page where they dump everything up. And then, uh, so where is the, 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 the screenplay for what we're doing? It's on the wiki. Where are all the screenshots? It's on the wiki. Where's all the source code? It's on the wiki. And it was nice for the graders to go by and just look at everybody's project page. And they could then figure out where everybody was and who was in trouble. These are midterm and final exam reviews, et cetera, et cetera. I want to talk a little bit about the galleries of student work because, as Ben said, I should say a little bit about um, comp media computation. So um, Georgia Tech, everybody who walks in the door has to take a course in computer science. It's required, and the requirement says it must be a course in programming. And for the first four years that we had this requirement, um, for the most part, we taught it in Scheme uh, from 1999 to spring 2003. Um, and overall, the course had about a 78% uh, success rate which sounds pretty good for intro CS classes, until you look at the colleges of business, architecture, and liberal arts, where none of the programs had an over 50% success rate. More than 50% of the students failed each time. So in the spring 2003, we got to try something different. And I developed this approach called media computation, where what I'm teaching students to do is how to manipulate the pixels in a picture, the samples in a sound, the frames in a video. We're teaching them computing in ways that they find relevant. We're answering the question why. So um, we do the same sorts of things you do any sort of a, a CS1. Every intro course, you manipulate all the elements of a data, maybe to get the maximum value or to compute the average. We do the same thing, except we compute the grayscale or the negative of the image by processing all of the pixels in the picture. Um, Every time you do uh, an intro course, you do something with only one part of the data set. We do the same thing by removing red eye here without changing any red that the person might be wearing. Um, same sort of computer science that's going on. And what we found is that we get um, increased pass rates. So for example, in business, it went from a 48.5% pass rate to an 87.8%. Uh, pass rate. Yeah, pretty considerable. And similar results in both architecture and um, uh, ar architecture and liberal arts as well. Um, but I did that so that I could set up this part of it. So I told you that I really buy into the situated learning, the idea that what motivates students is that they want to learn something that brings them into a community of practice. How do you motivate students in liberal arts, architecture, and business to learn programming? All right. I mean, do they recognize that that's part of the community of practice? What we end up doing is telling a story. Uh, I, I was, I was talking earlier that what we actually do is we draw on some ideas from Imagineering, the way that theme parks are created. And part of what doing that is to create a community of people who build things with media. And so we use the CoWeb as a way where students could share their work afterward. In any intro computer science courses, I'm sure anybody who's taught intro computer science knows, there's a huge issue of plagiarism, huge issue of students wanting to take each other's code. But when the point of the code is to produce an artifact, and I encourage you on the wiki to share your artifacts, it changes the relationship between the students and the teachers and the, and the work. You don't want to plagiarize after somebody else because you want your own collage. You want to do your things your way. And these are pictures of two pictures that are on the collage. And the students told us this and we asked about them. What do you think about the homework galleries on the co-ab? I want to read to you the second one. I know I always hate when people read up on the screen, but this is my all-time favorite quote that we ever got from a study in, um, uh, in the media computation. 
I don't ever look at it, the homework gallery, until after I'm done. I have a thing about not wanting to copy someone else's ideas. I just wish I had more time to play around with that and make neat effects, but Jess, the IDE we created, will be on my computer forever. So the nice thing about this class is you could go as deep into the homework as you wanted. So I turn in and then me and my roommate would do more afterward to see what we could do with it. I happen to know this is a female in international affairs, a liberal arts major, admitting to coding outside the requirements of the course. <laughs> so, but you get the sense of there's a community. I mean, me and my roommate afterward, we did some more. And we go look at what else is on the gallery. The, the, the wiki played an important role in creating this sense of community. It was a pretend community of practice for them, um, but it was a community where they wanted to share things. So, on to story number two. That, so that's the, the anchored collaboration story. Um, so the English composition folks came to us and said, could we use the wiki to improve, read, uh, to improve um, learning in, in the English composition class? In particular, they do an activity called close reading. Some of you may have done it in your English composition classes at some point, where you literally you're, you're highlighting prose or poems and writing margin notes, and you actually hand in all of your margin notes, and, that, and that's what gets reviewed in the, in the composition class. So we did something similar. We took the prose and poems and put them on a page, and then when you wanted to comment on something, you literally edited the page and just put asterisks on either side. And then that turns into a page uh, with that title. Now what's interesting for using a wiki for close reading is that everybody shares the same prose. So if somebody else has already commented on the line that you want to comment on, we'll go and add your comment. And now we turn the close reading activity into a collaborative activity. But it's a very close match to the, to the, to the, to the on paper activity. So Lisa Holloway Attaway taught two classes. One used the co-ed, one used existing tools as highlighting and margin notes. Um, and they did the close reading, either in text or online. Statistically significant benefits in learning. That the co-ed students wrote better final essays, and the co-ed co students afterward liked the idea of collaborating more. They liked the idea of using collaboration as, as part of what they're doing. But the really dramatic thing here is that we made everybody, students, a sample of students, the teachers, and even the system administrators, keep track, a, a diary, of how much time they spent on this. So like one possibility is, well, you know when, it's all, when the activity is all on paper? Nobody ever has to reboot the server, right? Well, what is the cost of the administrators occasionally having to reboot the server? And what we found was that overall, there was less time spent on the co-ed. So this is a pretty remarkable result. We're getting more learning from less time investment. Okay, so that led to this idea what if we could, if, since students are really enjoying the wiki and we're getting all these great effects on, on attitudes toward collaboration, why don't we use it to solve a problem we've always had at the university of getting students to talk across different classes, across silos, as we were talking about earlier. So in particular, we decided to create a wiki that was all about computational modeling. In the intro computer science courses, we teach the students MATLAB. They go to math and they take courses in differential equations. And then when they're juniors and seniors, they're writing code in their chemical engineering classes to implement differential equations in MATLAB. Wouldn't it be cool if you were a senior in chemical engineer and you could ask a MATLAB question of a freshman taking MATLAB then? I mean, not only is it cool for you because you get somebody who's studying MATLAB then to answer your question, but the freshman figures out, oh, that's why I'm taking MATLAB, because eventually I'm going to be doing that. All right. So we got a three-year grant of uh, 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 folks from chemical engineering, Matthew Ralph and Pete Ludovis, Tom Morley from Calculus, me in computer science. We set up this site, and in the first year, nobody used it at all. <laughs> all right? So we started jury rigging things, all right? So one time we decided that um, a senior, I think senior, junior, let's see. Yeah, so a engineering group students were pu pumping out simulation data for the differential equation students to take the data and pump back like eigenvalues or something, and 40% of the math students accepted a zero rather than collaborate with the engineers. <laughs> All right? So the mathematicians and engineers I'm working with say, well, you know, the problem is we talk in equations. All right, that's, just, that's the way that we, we work in math and engineering. It's so hard to do equations. Even now, it's, it's hard to get an equation up on the web. So we created a drag and drop editor so that you could create your equations and then drag them into the wiki. The engineering and math faculty used them in class, demonstrated their use, used it throughout the <coughs> semester so there'd be lots of equations up on the website. And over that time, not a single student even tried the equation editor. All right? So this is, this is a, we're now a year and a half into a three-year grant, and it is a remarkable failure. I mean, these are just <laughs> shocking. Yeah, really. It's a, it's, a, it's a perfect zero. Wow, it's not just a zero. It's a perfect zero. So we went back to NSF and said, we really want to change our focus. Why aren't they participating? 
All right, so we engaged much more in an ethnographic approach, and we were doing a bunch of interviews and focus groups. We came up with two bottom lines for, for what was going on in these. Um, first, the sense of competition. And the students say, well, you know, we're all competing for the same grades, and it's all on a curve, and so it's better if the other people aren't doing well. I don't want to give up any competitive edge that I have. Um, striking for interest, just for this audience, um, these are all quotes from a computer science class. The findings cross, but the quotes are actually from a computer science class. What's really striking is that, so we started hearing this. So we would get the syllabus and bring it to the interview and say, you see, it says right here, the class is not curved. Oh yeah, that's just what they say. <laughs> it's curved. All right? The second one is a strong sense of learned helplessness. I don't want to answer anything because then it'll just prove that I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay? And this is, this is a well-known phenomenon in education, a notion, uh, a notion of learned helplessness. So this one, I really wonder if there's a role for this in the MOOCs. Because you, I mean, all you're getting is a, is a certificate of completion. But there's a special certificate if you're in the top 10% of, of the people who complete a MOOC. Um, and Tucker Balch just finished, uh, did a great job. He just offered our first Coursera MOOC at Georgia Tech on computational investing. He got 41% of his completers to fill out a demographic survey afterward, which is really uh, pretty amazing, a, a, a significant amount of data. Um, and what he found was that 95% of the people said that they read the discussion forum, but only 30% ever posted anything. Okay? And so I wonder how much of this is either learned helpless or more likely the sense of competition. Story number three, embedded learning. So uh, I had a student, Brian Dorn, who is now at the University of Hartford as an assistant professor, I know Dean Mark, Brian, um, who studied graphics designers who program. Okay, it's a really interesting phenomenon. So graphic designers, for the most part, are, um, are freelance consultants. Um, they're, so literally, time is money. So if you can write a piece of code, do something batch processing, do something automatically for you, you're literally saving money. Uh, making money. So uh, Photoshop, the most common using ActionScript or GIMP are now programmable now. So graphics designers have an economic incentive to learn how to program. How are they doing it? For the most part, they don't take classes. They don't see any value in taking computer science classes. Um, so that was really a long way of saying, yes, I think an academic study would make me a better programmer, but not by a whole lot. So, uh, so most of these quotes are going to come from his uh, ICER 2010 paper. Um, so who are the graphics designers who program? For the most part, um, they're from arts and media. They don't see themselves as programmers. Are, are you a programmer? 83.3% say no. What do you do with code? Oh my god, the things that these people were creating. Um, one person, everybody, when we asked the, we did these demographic surveys, you know, we give, uh, what's the longest program you've ever written? 25 lines, 50 lines? Everybody was over 100 lines. We saw this one person who'd written code in ActionScript, the form of uh, JavaScript that, program, that controls Photoshop, to pull pictures and descriptions out of a database and format catalog pages automatically. Really remarkable. I mean, this is, this is some pretty serious hacking for somebody, for the most part, is coming from, from arts and media. Where are they getting their CS knowledge? And this is, you know, this is totally online education for embedded adult, for, for adults. How, where are they getting their, their knowledge? Mostly FAQs and other documentation. Books where they thought it was applicable. They don't want to read the four dummies books. They, what they really want is four graphics designers books. But there's not a whole lot of them. Right? So they're not really finding the things that, that they want. They trust code. They use lots, they, 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 they find code repositors and they use a lot of code from there. Okay, so then we had these interviews with them. So why don't you take computer science? Why don't you go take a computer science class? Because do you know who takes computer science? Who at the community practice of computer sciences? That's software engineers. They do the boring stuff. You're not going to be front end anything with computer science. You'll be back end everything. And they're programming something, and they don't really see what it's going to look like. They're just making it work. Okay? What's really striking and kind of frightening about this, we, we've done interviews with, with, with Girl Scouts, with preteens, as, as Ben was talking, that's where our Georgia Computes work has moved. And you hear things like this from preteens. Yeah, that's what computer scientists. These are all adults. These are all people 25 to 40 years old, and that's what they think we do. Pretty amazing. Um, who is in computer science? And they were old, and they were nerdy, and they were boring, and they like seeing them type up all these numbers and stuff and makes them see, see what makes them do. Right, so as you can imagine, this is not a community practice that these people want to join. Right, that's how they perceive what the computer science class is. So for example, I'm gonna bet these are not people who are ever gonna go join a computer science MOOC. 
Or if they do, they're going to be in that first group that, 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 that quits because that's not how they see themselves. But I love this one. All right, so one pushback you might give me is, well, they're, they're graphics designers. They don't really want to code. Oh, no, no, no. All right, I love this. The coding, I don't like to code, but the things that code can do is amazing. Because, I mean, like, the code is just, there's so much you can do with code and stuff, it's just like, wow. Right? <laughs> don't you want every undergraduate in computer science to say things like this? No, no, I don't love coding, but wow, the things you can do with code is just amazing. All right? So these people recognize that they want to be able to do things with code. They recognize they want to know more about code, but they don't want to have anything to do with computer science. So Brian gave them a set of tasks and watched how they solved them. And what he found was that they are learning less than they might because they don't really have the background knowledge. So Brian gave somebody a piece of code, and it's in JavaScript, and they see the variable x, so they go up to Google and they type JavaScript x. And shockingly, they got nothing useful. Right? They don't recognize the variable name doesn't buy you much at all. all right? Another time, he gave them a piece of code, and they did some Googling, and they landed on a page, and they're reading it and reading it. And after a half an hour, Brian stopped them and said, the language on this page is Java. You're doing JavaScript. This doesn't help you. But if you don't know that there's all these different languages, and you don't know there's these subtleties, I mean, where do you stop yourself? So um, Brian knew that they relied on code repositories from his previous work, that they go find places where there's lots of examples, and they download the examples, and they might change them. So what Brian decided to do was to create, take, create two different websites, one that's just a code repository. The other one is a case library. For each piece of code, there's also a story of how it came to be. And in that story, he highlights things like, that's called an array, that's called a Boolean, that's called a definite loop. And simply knowing the language dramatically increases the odds that when you do searching, you'll find the right thing. I mean, think of it, you've got a piece of code that's got try catch in it. The right thing to search for is exception handling. Exactly where would you see the words exception handling anywhere in the code? Right? So he's giving them the language. And the bottom line is that it really worked. The students, they, they liked the cases in both, in, in both groups. They liked what they got. They liked the cases. They liked the code repository. They coded the problems that he gave them the same. They were both able to solve their problems. Because if you think about it, if I give you something that's got CS instruction, and you don't really want to be a computer scientist, and it prevents you from getting your job done, you're not going to use it. Right? So it's really important that he got this second one. But then the case users on a test of computer science afterward showed they actually learned some concepts where the repository users did not. I like to think of this as vitamin enriching the ecology. <laughs> he found that these people were seeking out the knowledge they needed and they weren't getting it. And so he sprinkled some vitamins on the bushes where they were looking for their knowledge. And then they were able to get the computer science. Story number four, making online learning more efficient. This is where a lot of my, my research interest goes these days. High school teachers, how do we help there to be more high school teachers who know computer science in the United States? Uh, depending on how you count, there's somewhere between 24 and 30,000 um, uh, high schools in the United States, depending on you count charter, or you count K through 12, et cetera. Um, there are about 2,000 AP computer science teachers in the United States, one out of 12. All right, so how are we going to get more of them? For lots of reasons related to things like No Child Left Behind, we are most likely going to get in-service teachers to become computer science teachers, not people who are at their undergraduate level. All right, so how are we going to help them? What's involved in a, in, uh, a working professional to learn computer science entirely online? Sounds a lot like the MOOCs, pro the question. So um, Clara Benda did this really interesting study with a bunch of working professionals who were taking online computer science courses from Columbus State University, just down the road from us. Um, and this just appeared in December in the ACM Transactions on Computing Education. The bottom line, I'm going to show you some quotes, but the bottom line is, for the most part, we teach computer science as a form of apprenticeship. In just about all computer science classes, watch me for an hour. Okay, and then I expect you to spend eight hours in front of Eclipse to figure out what I told you in that hour. All right? it's, I'm going to model things for you, but then you're, for the most part you're going to figure it out on your own. Um, working professionals don't have hours to tinker around with code. They lack a lot of background, for example, in mathematics. For the, for the most part, in most parts of the United States, computer science is classified within the state as a business topic. And so you have business teachers who are learning computer science, people who used to teach keyboarding or maybe Microsoft Office, and now they're trying to teach computer science. And they get stymied by small errors. Actually, all those sound like my students. I'm sorry? That sounds exactly like undergraduate CS students. 
Guess Sometimes. Like small errors do not have hours to work on your programming thing. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> math background. <laughs> Absolutely. So it works for there too. Uh, I'm less concerned about them as I am about the high school teachers. We need a lot more of them. Um, so it would take me hours to find one comma out of place or to find that one something was wrong, right? So the, as working professionals, they're adults, right? They're like us. And so they block two hours to get their assignment done and they get one comma wrong and now they just lost a half hour of their two hours to get all their assignment done because they made this one stupid error, all right? So can we provide learning to them in a lower cognitive load manner? So. What we've been working on lately is trying, we're, I'll, I'll get to the book that we're trying to build. We're trying to build an electronic book. Um, and I'll explain that in a minute. Right now I want to talk to you about, about how do we build videos for this sort of a book. If you're going to build videos to teach something, how do you do it? Videos are a great way of providing what's called worked examples in cognitive science. Um, I'm going to show you how to do something. It's a completely worked out example. And it turns out that worked out examples are a great way of learning a lot of pro process knowledge. However, I watch you do one thing. How does that help me do the next thing without you? Well, Richard Katrenbone has been working on the idea of putting in labeled sub-goals. Right? We're simply going to tell you, this is what you're trying to do now. So for example, he did it in statistics. Um, I'm, you're going to compute the ANOVA. The first thing you're going to do is add up all the numbers in this set. And then you're going to divide by the number. What you've now done is compute the average. Okay? Com that you are now computing the average is a sub-goal that we can label those steps with. Um, it's not been tried in computer science. So we decided to do that. So um, we had a set of videos that Barbara Erickson, uh, my, my partner on this work, has developed to, to teach Android App Inventor. So it's a drag and drop programming language for building Android apps. Um, and we modified half of them, Lauren Marjolu did, uh, modified two of them to have sub-goal labelings in them. So here's the general pattern of the experiment. Um, everybody gets a video of how to build an app, and then they have to then do it. They come back a week later. We see how much they remember of how to build that first app. They see a second video. They have to start building that app, and then they get 10 minutes to start building a new app that they haven't seen before. Okay? So we're looking at performance immediately afterward, we're looking at retention a week later, and then we're looking at transfer. Okay. So this is an example of what does it mean to do sub-goal labeling. The instructions here are exactly the same. This is what the non-sub-goal list group, so they get textual instructions as well as video. And then the, the sub-goal group gets to the same instructions, but what you're now doing here is defining variables from a built-in. What you're now doing here is handling events from iBlocks. So let me show you what the videos look like. Here's, this is one of the original ones. And what we're going to want is a button that has a picture of a fortune teller in it. So we'll drag a button over from the basic palette. And under the properties, we'll change the text for the button, clear that out, and set an image for it. So we'll add an image. OK. And then this is the exact same video with sub-goal labeling. And what we're going to want is a button that has a picture of a fortune teller in it. So we'll drag a button over from the basic palette. And under the properties, we'll change the text for the button, clear that out, and set an image for it. So we'll add an image. OK. It's exactly the same video, just with the overlays? That's it. The instructions, the steps, are exactly the same except for the headings. And they're the same headings, the same sub-goals in both the textual and the video instruction. OK, everybody follow? All right. I think you'd agree this is a very small change. There's not a whole lot going on here. All right. So um, we had two uh, scorers who looked at the number of sub-goals attempted. So basically the, the steps of the instruction, the number they got correct, they had a lot of iterator reliability. This is the performance immediately afterward. Okay, statistically significantly, significant difference. The sub-goal group attempts more steps and gets more correct. Okay? And they do it faster. <coughs> And there's essentially no correlation between the amount of correctness and the speed. So it's not like you can run through all the steps, but you got 90% of them wrong. Um, for the most part, they're, they're going faster, statistically significantly, and um, there's no correlation with correctness. This is a week later. Okay, So there's no longer a statistically significant uh, gap between the number of steps corrected, but this group gets them, the sub-goal group gets them more correct. Okay, so it, 
a very small change, a week later, you, rem you get more of the steps correct. All right, so this one's really remarkable. On the transfer task, one of the things you had to do was define a variable. Like you pull out a, um, a, like a scrolling list or something, but then have to assign a variable associated with it. These people did. These people did not. And the group that didn't get the, the, uh, the, the sub goals tended to pull out lots and lots of blocks in this block programming language that they didn't really need. There was a lot more thrashing. They were wandering around. They didn't know what they were doing. I find these results really remarkable for a relatively small change. This is an example of what I think that we don't do enough of in computer science. And by extension, I also suggest that not a lot of the folks doing MOOCs have been doing a lot of simply looking to educational psychology and how do you do this stuff well. Um, for the most part in computer science, we've had students beating down our doors. I want a degree and I want to go make a billion dollars and I want to sell Instagram to Facebook. Right? The people wanted to go learn software engineering. But when you start talking about teaching high school teachers, right, their life goal is not to go create the next Instagram. Um, they want to learn enough computer science to help their students succeed. So we have to think of new ways of teaching them. Apprenticeship is not going to work, especially not for these working professionals. All right? um, why is this happening the way it is? I thought this was, uh, was really interesting. Lauren ran a second version of the experiment where everybody did think aloud protocols. And what she found was that the students said the sub-goal labels to themselves. So it's the sub-goal labels that are leading to these benefits. They're remembering those. And that's what's leading to the transfer. Oh, and uh, Lauren asked me to always add this. That in the sub-goal groups, people came up to them and said, that was fun. She says, it's psych, you don't get that very often. People come and say that, that experiment was fun. Um, we've now replicated these results. So these results were all with uh, undergraduate student um, psych pool uh, at Georgia Tech. Um, we've now replicated with a group of high school teachers, and we're getting the same results. So it's a, it's a pretty robust, robust finding. I have four slides. Can you have more? I'll, I'll just there are stats questions about this stuff. Um, how many groups, how many participants per group did you have? Uh, there was 20 per group. Okay. And had did that, you run yeah. more than two groups because you're reporting F statistics? Yes. There were, okay. there was three different experiments. Oh, that's, okay. Go. Okay. So what we're now trying to do is embed all of the stuff that we've been able, that we're working on, all these different ways of trying to learn computer science with lower cognitive load in a book. All right, the MOOC model is about taking, video, taking lectures and putting them on video. In general, nobody thought lectures were a particularly good way of learning anyway. Mm -hmm. Books are a pretty effective way of learning. We've been using them for thousands of years. And in particular, um, books have a nice model for get through as much as you can now, and when you have more time later, go through a few more pages. All right? People have a notion about how they do that. So we're trying to teach a book for teaching computer science. It's a book that the folks at RuneStone Interactive are doing. This is uh, Brad Miller and David Raynham at Luther College. It's got lots of really nice facilities. So for example, you program in the book. Okay? They've got a Python to JavaScript compiler. The code executes as JavaScript. It's amazingly fast. They've got visualizations built into it, which are really nice. We've been trying to build in more kinds of cognitive load low cognitive load activities. So one of these is called a Parsons problem. I give you a programming problem. I give you all of the lines of code <laughs> as refrigerator magnets. Drag them into the right place. Okay? You don't have to know anything about syntax. You will not get a comma out of place. You are programming, at least we think. We still have to explore this. And then we give you feedback based on what's going on. So. Um, conclusions. Um, what drives me is this notion of that context is a critical part of any sort of learning. Students have to know why they're learning something. Students want to become part of a community of practice. They want to be doing authentic activities. I have to give them a story for them to value what it is that they're doing. So the first one is about anchored collaboration. Why should you collaborate? Well, because you want to talk about this. And I'll give you a link right from there to go talk. Two, collaboration works for lowering learning costs, which is really cool, but only sometimes. Because if the culture doesn't value collaboration, it's really hard to warm culture. Culture trumps lots of things, including collaboration. Story number three, for adults, sometimes we have to embed the learning opportunities. Our graphics designers didn't really want to become computer science students. Um, so we had to figure out how to put the computer science where they were going to look for the learning. Um, you might think of it as just-in-time learning, but more it's sort of just-in-space learning. It's, it's where they were going, and that's where we could put the stuff. Finally, explaining how and why using sub-goal labels, um, it seems to be improving learning, and we're trying to embed that into a new kind of electronic book that we're doing. Um, 
We've been blessed with lots of good support, particularly from the National Science Foundation. And here are links, and I'd be happy to take more questions, including about the statistics. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. Can you talk more about what things can help combat a learned helplessness and whether you know, external factors translate? You know, do minority groups have more helplessness? Or? Oh, two questions. Um, how to combat learned helplessness. Um, there's a whole education literature on this. It's not something that I'm particularly well versed on. It was a three year project and so by the time we got to the end of year three we knew why nobody was collaborating. Um, but we weren't particularly successful in making the collaboration work. Um, well, I, I didn't, one thing that was particularly interesting about that study that I should have mentioned uh, earlier, that's just, it's sort of in passing, you wouldn't know about it because it's not in our papers unless you were at Georgia Tech at the time. Um, some of the students who refused to collaborate with the engineers were in the English composition study. So it wasn't that they didn't like the tool or they didn't want to collaborate. They just didn't want to collaborate there with those people. <laughs> All right? So it's clear that, that part of the issue has got to be that you've, you've got to create situations where students feel comfortable collaborating, where, where it's valued. Um, we did explicitly try in the chemical engineering class to do things like have increased dialogue, have the teacher do um, a, 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 what's considered a best practice in teaching computer science is do live programming in the front of class. Okay, because there's no professor in the world who can live program in front of class um, and not make mistakes. Um, uh, Gregory Abaud likes to say that you lose uh, 20 IQ points as soon as you get up in front of the room. So <laughs> you can't possibly program and not make mistakes. And then the students see, no, even the professor makes mistakes. It's perfectly natural. Um, and so that helps with those kinds of learned, learned helplessness. But I know in the, uh, working with my chemical engineering colleagues, they really tried to decrease the amount of learned helplessness to encourage dialogue. But it was really hard because students walking in the door expected, oh, this is a really hard class. I mean, I've talked to my, all my friends, and this is a really hard class, and it's really competitive. And so it, it, it takes a much greater effort to counteract that. Now, um, about issues of underrepresented minorities, that's not actually where we've been putting a lot of our work. All of them graduated high school, and 16 of them went on to post-secondary computer science, which is a really remarkable result. How did she get that? Um, she taught them to be game testers. She found they all wanted to play video games, but they all, she actually did this wonderful ethnographic work. They all wanted, they all saw video games as a field of competition. And if it's a field of competition, you don't try to change it. I mean, if you change the football or the baseball, that's called cheating, right? So they never used cheat codes, they never modified their games. Well, if you don't think of it as a technology, if you don't do any of those things, you don't tend to see it as a technology. How do you get kids to, how, did, how do you get kids to really, who love video games, to also see the video games as a technology? Well, she hired them to be game testers. A game tester's job is to see the technology as something with flaws, and then to document those flaws for somebody else to fix. Okay, and that's what led to her pretty dramatic results that, that these um, African-American teen males really saw this as a technology and something they wanted to build more of. Um, so what I like about Betsy's work is that not only does it show, it's about changing the framing. It's not changing the computer science. I mean, these kids actually asked for computer science classes. She started teaching them Python and Alice in the class because they wanted to have a better understanding of what it is that the game developers do anyway. How do I tell them about the bugs that we're finding? So it was, it was very effective that way. But it's also the story about authenticity, right? Um, it, it really is the real video games. I mean, we got Cartoon Network hired her to have their games tested. Um, they, they didn't want to just go use something toy. In fact, she had this really lovely Sigsy paper once where she, she taught the kids Alice and, and, um, and, and Python and then asked them afterward, which one do you like better? And the class split. And the kids who liked Alice liked it because, well, because what you produce, it looks like a video game. It looks real. The other one said, well, I've talked to some of the programmers. I know what they do. They don't use Alice. They use things that look sort of like the Python. All right? So it's, it's, for, it's focusing either on the end product or the process. But in any case, what they're buying into is the authenticity of it. That really looks like a video game, or that really looks like what video game developers do. OK, long answer. I, I'm sorry, I didn't really answer it very well. There was another question, sir. Yeah, I had a question about, about What about something like, um, we have a small groups and small groups can collaborate on the web in the same way that 
I have not. I have not. I'm sure that there are people who have explored those sorts of things. The Computer Sported Collaborative Learning, uh, there's a conference, there's the National Journal of Computer Sported Collaborative Learning. I was doing a lot of this work until that media computation thing happened to me. Um, and then I was using media comp, I was using the wikis um, as a way of making the media comp work through these things like the galleries in order to create it. Um, but we didn't really deal with trying to deal with the problems of, of, of learned helplessness. I imagine that, I mean, I don't know this, but I imagine that as your friends, you know, your small group sort of like becomes confident in this thing, you might want to make it more and more public and kind of do it in you know, I don't so, know the, um, well, I, I think it's a fascinating question. I, most of my experience, with the, the work that I have to do with the COEB now, is actually this fascinating problem of what do you deal with a fairly successful technology a decade later. All right, so what's happening, um, almost all of our co-webs were taken down. They were removed from the web. And the reason why was because people signed their names, which turned out to be a FERPA problem because it was possible to say, oh, you took this class at this university at this time. So they're all removed. Now, there's people who are doing this really interesting work and, and we knew this was going to happen before the wikis were turned, were, were, were turned off because students were always saying to me, um, I've applied for this job and if I Google on my name, I find this page that I created with these pictures that I don't really want to be there anymore. Would you please take the page down for me? Which actually, it's a wiki and so it saves all versions. Actually, it's fairly complicated to make sure it's completely gone. There's no trace of it anymore. Um, but there's this, some fascinating work on sort of identity management over multiple years. So in this class, only a pseudonym might appear. And then later on, I might say, you know, well, I've become a, a rock star and I want my name associated, you know, or maybe I'm a corporate lawyer and now I don't want my name associated. But to be able to control how much of your identity you display at any time. Uh, I think it's a, a fascinating set of issues, but we haven't explored that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned um, no child left behind when you were talking about training high school teachers to teach computer science. Yes. Um, I'm a recovering high school teacher myself. <laughs> <laughs> computer science was an elective. Yeah. Really Sort of as an issue of access, so that as we become more and more digital, we need to all know how to program computers so that we can, you know, I'm not asking the question very clearly, oh, it's, but, but uh, we need to all know how, I mean, all of our high school students need to know how to program computers so that they can participate fully absolutely. in our new culture. So is this expandable, do you think, or, or can you take the techniques that you're learning, can we take them? So there, there's, a, there's a whole other hour talk on that, but <laughs> so let me try to give you... Yeah, right, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, just before I catch my flight. Um, so let me try to spell out some of the, some of the story. Uh, so absolutely, we know that access is actually the critical thing which, um, well, one hypothesis, is the critical thing which is keeping um, more underrepresented minorities from going into computer science. Um, there's a wonderful book by Jane Margolis and company called Stuck in the Shallow End. I highly recommend it to folks. Um, it was a study of four LA Unified School District high schools and about how computer science played out in those schools. And the metaphor of the book, Stuck in the Shallow End, um, is, is based on a, a, a truth that for many years, um, uh, particular Hispanic and African American people were not allowed into public pools. Or like in California, Mexicans were allowed on the last day of the month because then the water would be drained. And to this day, uh, CDC reports that the drowning rate for African Americans is twice what it is for white Americans. Because it sort of set up a culture. No, you just don't swim. This is not what you do. Um, and what, he sa what, what she's saying is that they are then stuck in the shallow end of the pool. Well, not giving access to computing education means that there are people who are going to be trapped, stuck in the shallow end of the financial pool as well. And so access is the critical thing. And so she's got a big project called Exploring Computer Science, exploringcs.org, um, where she's trying to create a kind of computer science that actually makes it into minority serving high schools. Um, starting from LA, but it's going all over Chicago Public Schools has adopted Exploring CS in a big way. Um, I've been part of an effort called Georgia Computes. Uh, um, the link is up, yeah, right there, georgiacomputes.org, for the last six years to try to change computing education within the state of Georgia. Um, a lot of our efforts has been, I mean, some of our most successful efforts have been at the public policy level. So it is the case that Barbara has trained high schools, has, uh, I'm sorry, has offered professional development to teachers in 38% of Georgia's high schools. And those schools produce 56% of all of the CS students in Georgia uh, two years ago that came from Georgia. Right, so it's a huge impact. Um, 
But some of the big things that happened is that we got a high school curriculum defined in Georgia. AP Computer Science counts towards high school graduation. And there is now a certificate program, an endorsement program for high school uh, in computer science. Um, when the, BP, the Broadening Participation in Computing program at NSF was revised last year, they made a decision that they would no longer allow for there to be state level alliances. Which is a problem because all of K through 12 is defined at the state level in the United States, or lower, uh, at the district level. So um, we teamed up with the other state-based alliance, CATE, uh, the Commonwealth Alliance for IT Education in Massachusetts, to form something called Expanding, uh, expanding Computing Education Pathways, um, expandingcomputing.org. We're a new alliance that we are a service organization to help other states do these kinds of changes. So we're working very closely with South Carolina and California. Rick Adrian, the other PI and I, are coming out here in May. Um, to, to Maryland, because I know the, the folks here have got a, a burgeoning effort to try to improve computing education in, in Maryland. Um, so it's happening in bits and pieces. There's a big effort the NSF has funded called CS10K. They want to have 10,000 teachers ready to teach the new AP in computer science um, before it comes out. Given that we have 2,000 today and it should be out in about five years, it's a really, really big problem. Which is so to, to address your the original comment. So where does No Child Left Behind come into this? Um, because uh, NCLB requires that for you to be highly qualified in something, you have to have a student teaching experience as a pre-service teacher. Um, if your problem is too few teachers in a subject, you don't get a whole lot more of them. Because where are you going to do the student teaching? Right, so pre-service is not the way that we're going to ramp up computer. I mean, you want pre-service programs, but you're not going to ramp them up very, ramp up the number of teachers very far that way. There are a lot of high school teachers who are not going to be able, don't want to continue doing what they're doing or need to find a new subject to be able to continue teaching. That's going to be our best bet for getting more computer science teachers. That's why we're looking at things like an electronic book because we're not going to get them all. We're not going to get 10,000 people into physical classrooms in enough time. All right, so it's got to be distance education. It's got to be online. That's why this work. Yes, Ben. Uh, you've obviously been focusing on call it introductory computing. Do mm -hmm. you have any thoughts about uh, computer science majors at the junior or senior level and what it takes to educate them well? So, and what are we doing that's good and not good? Um, so the best thing, there is a, a growing effort, and I'm actually involved in a couple of efforts that are, that are just being proposed to NSF now, um, to define what's called CSPCK. Uh, it's computer scientists. We like abbreviations, right? Well, this one happens to come from education. Uh, PCK is pedagogical content knowledge. Um, if you ever read how people learn, one of the things that they talk about is that there is general education knowledge. Here's how you teach well. But it's not nearly as effective as here's how you teach X well. A good English teacher is really good at teaching English. It may not be so good when they move into history. All right. So what the knowledge they know about teaching that is called pedagogical content knowledge. So what is computer science pedagogical content knowledge? What are the best ways of teaching computer science? And so Beth Simon is heavily involved in this effort. And she has a set of papers that are coming out in SIGC um, next month uh, in Denver, SIGC 2013. And it's a set of three papers that show what's happened at the University of California, San Diego, since they moved to peer instruction. Um, the, the short form of peer instruction, clickers. Okay? Clickers, it turns out, improve the pass rate in their upper level classes even by 50%. It's a dramatic impact. So they've shown that in their intro course, their intro course, they moved in 2008. They used peer instruction. They used pair programming. So two students at a keyboard, one keyboard, but two students, so that they kibitz off one another and not everybody, no one person hogs the keyboard. And they moved to media computation. And they, they believe that it's the three of them. They're in a quarter system. So only changed one quarter class. And now, even, so how many years later now? Five years later. They have more CS students in the sophomore year, both retention and new students drawn in, which is a pretty dramatic result. So my answer is that I think that at the upper levels, what we need to do is think more about pedagogical content knowledge. How do we teach computer science well? And some of the things that we know work is programming in the front of the classroom, uh, peer instruction, uh, pair programming. Pair programming helps a lot. And then approaches like media computation that help to contextualize. For our own CS students, we don't do the they don't they don't get media computation. They get robots. Um, I was involved in the uh, evaluation effort when we first started putting the robots into the intro course. And my favorite result is when we asked students, "So, what are you learning in this class?" The students said, "Computer science." Nobody, and this, this was an interview, so it wasn't like that was you know filled. Was, was nobody said robotics? 
Robots were the way that they were learning computer science. They recognized that it was, in some sense, just the context, and robots are a perfectly good context for learning computer science. But what they were learning was computer science. Sorry. So we know that context, it doesn't have to be learning about that. We actually have one result where um, we compare, we have our computer architecture course where they use the Patent Patel book, uh, Pretend Processor, uh, learn all about assembly language level, versus the class where they program the Game Boy. You learn a lot of the same stuff because there's no operating system on the Game Boy. Um, and what we find is the students who learn to program the Game Boy end up liking computer architecture more at the end and have done more programming on their own just because it was fun. You know, it's not all that much fun to pretend, program a pretend assembler. Um, and so people just don't say, oh boy, do I want to do more of this? <laughs> people do want to do more programming the Game Boy. So the context, even at the upper level classes like computer architecture, really does seem to work. Yes, sir? I want to ask a question about, um, well, before I even ask my question, I want to say about the study you mentioned earlier about the, um, I, I forget what, what the uh, lady's name was. Betsy DeSalvo and funny. Glitch Game Testers. It's, it's, it's funny because I actually went to Savannah State University and uh -huh. I majored in computer science. And the reason why I got into it is um, I was in the video games in high school. So now I, I have my bachelor's degree in computer science. My younger brother, he's getting his bachelor's degree in computer science. Very cool. Did, actually, in Armstrong. In oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, I went to a conference um, last week. It was the Atapia Diversity mm -hmm. Computing, sure. uh, Computing Conference and here in DC. One, one of the one of the uh, speakers mentioned how the computer science or the, the roles of computer science are it, how they're um, how they're displayed in the media and how some of those stereotypes. Like I've, I've seen some of the comments about the back end, the kind of nerdy. Yep. How, how do how do you think the media representation of computer science? is uh, affecting how uh, people enroll. View computers, how, how they people view computer science, in other words. Yeah, so I think it's a great question. Um, so I, had a, I just graduated a student, Mike Huner, uh, did really interesting work, um, asked the question about how do students' misconceptions about computer science impact the educational decisions that they make. Um, the bottom line, not at all. It's really funny. Students just follow a curriculum. But that's, there's a whole dissertation story there. Um, but the first study that he did with me, he, he started working with me in 2008. So it was five years after we started media computation. And um, part of the media computation story is that we also have courses just for the engineers, where they program in MATLAB, and we have courses for the computer scientists, where they program robots. So everybody, all the different majors, are getting a computer science course aimed at them. It's five years later. What's the impact? Okay, so this is a, a form of the question that you're asking. So we went and interviewed, um, he did what's called an autobiogra autobiography story. He got a couple dozen seniors tell a story about how they've, in, how they've interacted with computer science and computers in their lives. And, and then he did spot check interviews with some of them. And the bottom line was, was that the impact of that intro course, almost nothing at all. And, and here's what's, what, what goes on. If you chose a major, where you expect to use computing, sort of relating back to this community of practice class, then the first class was great. Because it was, well, if you wanted to become an engineer, the first course is all about engineering and computing. This is really cool. If you want to be a computer science major, your first course is about programming a robot. This is really cool. If you're a history major, OK, and then you take the first course and you really like it. If you're a history major, you are choosing a major where you don't expect to use computing for the rest of your lives. You have to take this first course. You hate it. You get done with it, and for the next four years, you almost never take another computer course. You use computers only peripherally. At the end, after four years, so no, there's not a whole lot of impact. So um, in the end, these larger factors like community practice, where do you want to be when you grow up, how do you see yourself, that has a, lar a lot larger impact than the one class. I will give a, a, a brief um, reference. Um, two of my students, uh, Brian Dorn I mentioned, and Allison Elliott too, are working on a, uh, an attitude survey about computer science. Um, and they're also going to be presenting at SIGC 2013. It's going to be a great SIGC. You've got to come. Um, sure. And uh, one of the things that they found is that there's this attitude survey, which is about how your attitudes about the field are like experts in that field. One of the findings over, over multiple fields is that in physics, chemistry, and biology, students' attitudes after the course diverge more from experts than before the course. The opposite in computer science. That students before computer science tend to be more divergent and after it are more convergent. Why? Um, 
this is a hypothesis. This is a brand new result that they've looked at. A, they've looked at several CS1s, so it's not just one course. Um, one possibility is that when you come into your chemistry, biology, or physics course, you kind of know what chemistry, physics, and biology are about. And then you take your first real course at it and you say, oh no, I was completely wrong. This is nothing like what I thought it was going to be. In computer science, on the other hand, I saw Big Bang Theory. Is that what computer science is about? I don't know. And then you have this course and it's like, oh, that's what computer science is. And so you end up being more convergent. But that's a hypothesis. We don't know. So it's, it's kind of an open question. What is that impact of that first course on your attitudes about computing, about the field? Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the type of methodologies that you're, <clears throat> that you're using, yep. how does that uh, translate into the workplace when you know, some of the people that are, that are taking these courses are doing it as uh, part-time education to improve their current work life? How does that experience translate to the workplace and do they find that they took was advantageous to them? use those methodologies and maybe not have to see them again in the workplace? Yeah, I don't know. It's a great question. Um, the adult education work that we're doing, which is a, a bigger part of, a bigger focus of what we're doing, has not been face-to-face. -face. It's been distance. And so, um, and we haven't done follow-up to say, so how does this impact you? We're trying to do that with the high school teachers. We're trying to follow up and say, so what's the impact in how you teach and, 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 uh, and what's the impact on student learning? Um, but it's really hard to go from trying to figure out how do we make do computer science learning online at all to impacts on their teaching and then impacts on student learning. So I don't know much about that. And I also, we haven't really tried this with, for example, continuing education settings. Um, so I don't know much about that answer either. Though I do recognize that that's probably where the MOOCs have been most effective. Um, I, I mentioned Tucker Balch did, got a nice set of demographic data from the end of his Coursera MOOC that he just offered in computational vesting. One of the striking things about the completers was about how much computer science they'd had previously. 30% of them had their master's degrees, 10% had their doctorates. Okay? So 40% having prior experience. So why did they complete the whole MOOC? Because they found it valuable? because they saw it as an interesting way of extending their knowledge and refreshing their knowledge. I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do with the MOOCs. What I worry about is whether or not they could really work for intro courses, which is sort of the next big challenge about exploring them. I doubt that. I, I, sat, I tried the MIT course on uh -huh. circuits. edX, yeah. You know, now I'm, I got a PhD in electrical engineering. I knew something about circuits, at least yep. in the old days. Yep. That course was so difficult. <laughs> the, the, the teacher went, you know, I mean, I don't see how any person not really right in that MIT right. menu would really be keeping up with it. And I understand out of 140,000 students, I think about 5,000 students completed. That's right. And 80% of them had had a circuits course before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, would, I would say that the best thing I would say for online learning is to get it to people who are having trouble, mm -hmm. not to people who are already very good. But, and I, I, I agree with you, but the challenge then is what's the form of the online learning so that it actually works for those people. Because I don't think that the current form, the current no, no, structure will work well for, 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 um, for, for novices. Yes, sir? I think uh, last question, then we'll uh, Yep. So do you think the high school students class or online MOOC introductory course should have like different languages such as Alice or Scratch instead of Python or Java? Or do you think that those languages for learning as a stepstone or uh, they have some different values in them? Now you said a MOOC. Yeah, MOOC. Okay, so there's, there's like there's a whole bunch of fascinating questions in your question. So first of all, if you're going to teach it in a MOOC, should you use things like Alice or Scratch or the rest of it? Um, we're saying no right now just because I can't run Alice and Scratch inside of a browser. <laughs> and I think it's a really critical issue. Um, it's got to run, in, I mean, most high schools, uh, there was a wonderful study of Alice being put into high schools talking about the biggest problem they had was not professional development, it was getting Alice installed in the schools. I mean, the stories they talked about trying to take it into some schools where not only are the CD-ROM drives removed, but the USB port's been filled with a glue gun. <laughs> 
All right, so there's like literally no way of getting, and then there's firewalls all over the place. You can't get anything on these machines. So th that's a real issue. Now, in terms of face-to-face, -face, um, yeah, absolutely. I think that starting with something like Alice or Scratch or App Inventor, we have lots of data that the block-based languages, the graphical languages, are much easier to get started with. However, they only go so far. There's also a bunch of older data which shows that graphical programming languages it, for, for a certain level of complexity, I mean, even like a screenful, um, text is actually easier to understand and easier to debug. So there needs to be a crossover, and there was great work by Chris Hunthausen a few years ago showing that there is a transfer of knowledge. People go from graphical languages to textual languages and do transfer their knowledge of things like variables and iteration, which is a really great positive result. But this is a, this is a hot area of research. There's a lot of things to be explored there yet. Great. All right. I think we're going to thank you very much. Uh, thank you all very much. Appreciate it.